Hi, I'm Andrew Connell, and I'm an MVP with Office Servers and Services. And in this training module, we're going to look at how we can use the Microsoft Graph REST API inside of an ASP.NET MVC-based application. Specifically, we're going to do an introduction to the Microsoft Graph REST API. We're going to do a little bit of introductory stuff and then jump into the SDKs and code samples and look at a few resources that are available to us as well. Microsoft's Office 365 Developer Vision focuses on the user's experience and their data. As a developer, you can bring your applications into their user experience. So with over 1.2 billion users of Office worldwide, this is a huge opportunity to provide a window into your different applications, as well as being able to connect into their data and add intelligence to your applications. There are currently 850 million events created a month and a total of 470 petabytes and more of data stored in the service that can add value to and for our users of your applications. So what does it look like to build an application that's gonna be integrated with Office 365? Well, as you can see at the very bottom here, we've got access to a lot of different data sources inside of Office 365. And the best way to get to them is using the Microsoft Graph API. That Microsoft Graph API is going to essentially act as a proxy to all of these different services that are available to us. Now, in order to call the Microsoft Graph, we're going to have to first authenticate. And we're going to do that using Azure AD. And that's going to allow us to authenticate either using our consumer accounts, like a Microsoft account, or using our work and school account, or like an Azure AD based identity that we would use in Office 365. You also are going to be able to leverage the OpenID Connect, which is going to give us the ability to get some information about the currently logged on user. Now, once we are authenticated, we then have the option of many different ways that we can talk to the Microsoft Graph. And the way we're going to do that is using different environments. Now, in the case of this scenario, we're going to be looking at using Android Studio and working with a strong API uh, SDK for the Microsoft Graph. And then we can build our application using anything else that we want to end up using here. So in this case here, we're going to build one that's going to show events from a calendar in Office 365. Now let's talk a little bit about authentication and how this works with the Microsoft Graph. The Microsoft Graph leverages Azure Active Directory or Azure AD, like so many other cloud services from Microsoft. And this is going to provide authentication and authorization capabilities for our applications. You can create web apps as well as native apps with Azure AD apps. And in addition, users can authorize the application using the delegated consent, where they grant the application to act on their behalf. Global tenant admins can also grant consent to all users as a different type of consent. We call that the admin consent. Azure AD applica application authentication that's impl is implemented using the OAuth2 protocol. So users are redirected to Azure for authentication credentials so that the custom applications never get the actual credentials of the user. We just redirect them over to Azure and then Azure is going to give us back some information or give the user some information that they will provide the application to log in. Depending on the authentication flow that we leverage, the app is ultimately going to get an access token that's only valid for a specific amount of time for a specific user with specific permissions and for a specific resource. In our case here, that's the Microsoft Graph. These access tokens can be refreshed after they expire using an associated refresh token. And the login process also supports uh, multi-factor authentication and federated authentication that Microsoft's Azure AD supports. Now, native applications differ from web applications in a few different ways because first, they're multi-tenant by default, and you don't need to worry about sending app credentials or app um, secrets when the native app is distributed because it can't contain a secret because once you distribute the app, it's never really going to be a secret. So instead, we're going to use some special redirection URLs. Now, all Office 365 cloud services, including SharePoint Online and the Microsoft Graph, leverage Azure AD for authentication and authorization. And this means there is a single authentication flow that we're going to use for Office 365 applications, as well as those that are created to leverage the Microsoft Graph. 
Now, Office 365 has some direct API endpoints, and for this is for all the different services that you may invoke, things like Outlook or OneDrive or OneNote. Um, direct endpoints have new functionality before it's gonna be exposed to the Microsoft Graph API. That would include things like Outlook webhooks or time zones on a calendar. The direct endpoints are gonna get those first. However, what you are gonna be able to do is eventually those things will make it to the Microsoft Graph. So the Microsoft Graph acts as a proxy to these other endpoints, but you may see functionality show up in those direct endpoints first before you see it show up in the Microsoft Graph where they will add support for it eventually. So how can we access the Microsoft Graph? Well, there's two different ways we can do it. We can do it using the direct REST endpoint. And what's nice about that is we can use any language and any framework, and it works on every single platform. The only requirement is we just have to be able to do requests to an HTTPS endpoint, which tons of libraries support that and utilities support doing that. Or you can use native SDKs, and that's gonna utilize a, the framework and platform specific implementations like for Windows or um, OS X or iOS or Android or different native environments like that. And it's also gonna abstract the details away for constructing and processing the REST request over HTTP. So there are examples for an SDKs for .NET, for iOS, Android, PHP, Ruby, JavaScript. It's just about an SDK for everything you can imagine for the Microsoft Graph um, SDK. If you check the Graph website at graph.microsoft.com, you'll see a list of all the SDKs there. So let's talk a little bit about the Microsoft Graph REST API. It's all gonna start with a, the me endpoint, and that's gonna give you a reference to who you are or your information inside of the Microsoft Graph. From there, we can integrate and pull into a whole bunch of other stuff, like your mobile property, so like your mobile phone, your address, your name, your title, your photo, aliases, all sorts of things. So how do we do this? You just issue a GET request to these different things. So here, if I do the slash users, I can go to a specific user and passing in their ID. I can just go to slash me to get my information, or I can go to all the users in my organization by going to slash contoso.com, which is my org, and then go slash users and pass in the ID of the user. Um, I can maybe get a specific property like the about me property by using the select uh, um, query string parameter, and I can also get the photo for that individual as well. Now, the user's endpoint, what's nice about this is it allows me to also see relationships between different people. So I'm able to figure out when I go to a user, I can see who their manager is. And once I see their manager, I could also see things like who the direct reports are for that manager, or I could see things um, such as like what groups they're a member of. So what does the code for this look like? Well, you can see here, it's just extending off the user object. So if I go to the me, my, the me endpoint and I do slash manager, I can see who my manager is. Or if I go to the uh, user Yina at Contoso in the Contoso organization, I can find out who are all of uh, Yina's direct reports. I can find out what groups I'm a member of by going to the me slash member of or I can even see what the photo is for one of my colleagues in the contoso.com organization. I can also see information or data about uh, me or my information that I have access to, such as my messages or my email uh, emails that I have. The code for this is gonna be just going to my, my uh, me endpoint and then go to slash messages. Or if I wanted to see the top five messages, I can put that in the query string. Or if I can want to see the top five, skip the first five, so maybe like going to the second page of information. But I want to sort that by date time created. I could use that query that you see listed there. And I could also get specific values back, like say I only want the subject and the sender, but I'm looking for where any emails were sent from alexd at contoso.com. I can also access events. So by just going to the events endpoint and looking at the code here, I can see things like going to the events, getting the top five events, 
or I can see events for a specific calendar view passing in filters for the start date and the end date time. I could also see files related to the uh, to me, the ones that I have access to and that I've worked on. And furthermore, I can even see those that people who I have access to and who have, who have made available that information, I can see what files that they've been working on as well. Again, permissions are going to be, are going to filter things out based on if I have rights to be able to see this kind of information. I can see what documents that they that that person has created. I can see what things that they've marked as public. I can see things that have been shared with um, with me. So maybe it's created by this one individual and then he has shared it with me as the user or maybe he's modified one of my documents. I can see all of those relationships. And all of that is found inside the, you can get access to it using the REST API. So if I go to the me slash drive slash root slash children endpoint, I can see all of my files. I can see a specific item by just passing in its ID. Or I can see a history of that item by going to slash drive slash items slash the ID of the item and then look at the property, who is it last modified by? I can see all the files for someone else. So Marriott Contoso, who's made her files public, I can see all of her files off the root, uh, or I can even go into subfolders. And the same thing is true by finding, you know, what files were last modified by uh, Mary's manager. In addition, I can also work with tasks. So I can work with things like tasks from Planner, or I can look at tasks that have been not just created by me, but I can also tasks that have been assigned to a specific group. Again, the code for this is very straightforward. I'm just going to a specific endpoint. In this case here, it's an example of using the beta endpoint. So the graph has two different endpoints. One is the V1 endpoint and one is the beta endpoint. And the beta endpoint is stuff that it may change. It may not change. It may We may see where it gets to in GA, but we can play with things before they're actually shipped. So this is a view of like just a sample of what you could do with the Microsoft Graph and working with the REST API. And all the native SDKs have the same support as well to going to these different things. But with the REST API, you can get to just about anything that you can think of. So let's talk about Azure AD applications and the graph dependency. All Microsoft Graph access options, like the REST API or the SDKs, they all depend on Azure AD. So we're going to have to first register an Azure AD application to access the Microsoft Graph. I'm then going to use that application to authenticate, gain authorization, and obtain an access token. The access token that's included in the underlying HTTP request to call the Microsoft Graph, I'm going to put that inside of the header of the request. Let's talk about the single authentication flow for Office 365. Users are gonna first sign in using OpenID Connect. Now that's an extra layer on top of the Azure AD OAuth authentication. And that's gonna give you some identity information in the response once a user authenticates. Azure AD and Office 365 services can leverage this authentication model. And it supports both Microsoft federated authentications or multi-factor authentications and uh, federated user sign-ins. We can do work with device apps, websites, single page applications, and service apps as well. And then finally, we can also pin applications to the Office 365 app launcher uh, from the, um, the app launcher that we have or the My Apps page inside of Office 365. The authentication endpoint is also gonna allow us to have this thing called the common consent framework. And what that does is that's gonna allow us to define permissions that our application is gonna need and our users are going to have a common interface that they're going to see that they have to go through to support that authentication or to approve those different kinds of requests. Now we have a couple different authentication options. You can authenticate using Azure AD, which it has a specific flow, or we can use um, Azure AD and uh, Microsoft accounts. And the way this works is that the first one, Azure AD only, is the V1 endpoint for Azure AD using the ADAL libraries. Um, the second one is the converged authentication uh, option where you can have, um, you can, it's a, called a common or a, a converged uh, 
um, authentication model where the V2 endpoint for Azure AD allows us to sign in using our Microsoft account or our Azure AD account. And what that will then uh, do is that'll figure out, let Azure AD figure out which um, uh, underlying identity provider we're using, but it's transparent to the application and a single token can work across both of them. Now, many apps want to sign users in from both Microsoft accounts and Azure AD. And what's nice about this, this V2 uh, converged endpoint is that it's a single endpoint that supports both OpenID Connect and OAuth. So again, OpenID Connect is a layer on top of um, OAuth, which allows us to provide some identity information back in addition to an access token. It also is going to give us a single SDK instead of having to have two different SDKs for two different authentication models a single end user sign-in experience, a single app registration experience, and best of all is it works with the Microsoft Graph. So we simply have a single API endpoint that we can use to get both business data from Office 365 or consumer data from things like OneDrive Consumer or from Outlook.com. Now we have two different, way, two different sites we can use for registering an application. The Azure AD portal works with the V1 endpoint and you're gonna have to define the permissions or scopes ahead of time. It only supports Azure AD users. The Microsoft Graph supports both consumer or Microsoft accounts and the um, Azure AD based or work and school based logins as well for business users. So the Microsoft Graph team recommends that we use the V2 endpoint instead of just the V1 endpoint. Um, this is gonna allow us to have the converged authentication that works with both Microsoft accounts and Azure AD. And it's gonna support dynamic consent to define the scopes and permissions at runtime. So let's look at what's involved in creating an Azure AD application with the app registration portal. So the first thing you're going to do is go to the app registration portal and register a new application. Um, this is just this is not creating the code base. This is just creating getting an ID for the application so that Azure AD knows who this is and knows what resources it has access to. You then are gonna add a platform to it. And that's gonna be either a web platform or a native platform for like say a, um, a mobile-based app application. Um, the web platform is what we're gonna use for our ASP.NET based application. So we're gonna add that. And then we're also gonna to need to grab, uh, specify the return URLs or redirect URLs. And that's where Azure AD will send the user back once they've successfully authenticated. And then you optionally can also define the permissions ahead of time, but the permissions can also be uh, requested dynamically using the dynamic consent capability that we have in the V2 endpoint. In this demo, I wanna show you how we can go about creating a web application, but first we need to register an Azure AD web application uh, in the app registration portal. So what I've done first is I've navigated over to my apps.dev.microsoft.com site, which is the app registration portal. And I'm gonna go ahead and log in with my account here. And this is a uh, Azure AD account that I can use to log in with this. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a brand new um, application. So I'm going to call this my test web application and I'll go ahead and click create. Now the first thing you want to do when you create this is grab this ID that gets created first because we're going to need that inside of our application um, a little bit later because everywhere we want to use this app we're going to definitely need that um, ID. Now if I scroll down a little bit I'm going to also want to create a password for my application so I'm going to click the generate new password and it's gonna give me a password. And I need to make sure that I copy this right away um, before I click okay, because it's only gonna sh be shown to me one time. So I'll go ahead and do that, and then I'll click okay. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and add a platform. So the platform I'm gonna add for this one is a web platform. So I'll come over here and I'll click web, and it's gonna ask me to add in any URLs that I wanna use uh, for my application. So just for now, I'm just gonna say HTTPS localhost colon 1234. All right, now this is not gonna be something we're gonna use. We're gonna to have to come back to this uh, to add in additional URLs uh, in the future for applications we're gonna create. 
Now, the next thing I'll do too is while I can use dynamic permissions or for um, a um, dynamic consent, I wanna show you how to, how to specify permissions. So I'm gonna click add under delegated permissions and I'm gonna scroll down a little bit to my calendars.read and click okay. Because that's the permission that we're gonna end up needing for our application. And then I'm gonna go ahead and save it. So right now, everything is all set up. We're in pretty good shape. We don't really have anything else that we're gonna to need to do uh, with this application. It's all ready to be used inside of a, another app that we're gonna end up creating uh, with either could be a, an ASP.NET app or just straight REST calls, but whatever it is, we've now got an, our app set up and we're good to go. In this section, we're gonna look at how we can do manual authentication and interaction with the Microsoft Graph REST API. So we'll first look at the authentication piece, and that's gonna be authenticating with Azure AD and obtaining an access token, and then how we can call the Graph REST API. So the first step is to obtain an OAuth2 token, access token from Azure AD. Now the Microsoft Graph leverages Azure AD like so many other applications that we have out there. And we've already gone through a lot of the different topics here um, that I've already talked about in the previous section. We've already done that here on this slide. Uh, the key point here is that when you build for your authentication piece, you can use multiple different uh, options for authentication. You can either use the Azure AD V1 endpoint or the V2 endpoint. And depending on which one you're gonna use, it's gonna also determine which SDK uh, you're gonna, you can take advantage of that's offered from Microsoft. So if you're using the V1 endpoint, you're gonna use the ADAL authentication library. Um, however, the recommendation is to use the V2 endpoint. Um, what the VN2 endpoint is gonna allow us to do is to uh, have a little bit more flexibility in terms of defining permissions uh, for dynamic consent and a couple other options as well. So the recommendation is to use the V2 endpoint and uh, make your life easier by using the Microsoft Authentication Library. So prior to calling the Microsoft Graph REST API, you must obtain an access token. So you're gonna select the OAuth2 flow for your scenario the OAuth2 authorization code grant flow is the most common one to use for interactive apps, such as web applications. And I got a link to, there to the actual documentation for it. So let's look at how we can manually obtain an authorization code from Azure AD using the Azure AD OAuth v2 authorization endpoint. To request an authorization code, uh, you must first initiate an interactive login using a URL with the specific parameters from Azure AD OAuth2's V2 endpoint. This will start the interactive login process with Azure AD by prompting the user to grant the application consent if they haven't already requested the uh, consent for the, these specified scopes and redirect the user to the redirect URI with the requested authorization code. You're gonna to need to include the following values in the, in the request that you issue over to um, Azure AD. You're gonna pass in the client ID, which is the Azure AD application ID, the scope, which is a space delimited list of scopes, otherwise known as permissions that you're requesting. The response type tells the endpoint the type of the grant that you are requesting. And in this case, you're using the authorization code flow. The response mode specifies the method that, sh that can be used to send the resulting token back. You can, this can be a query or it can be a form post. The redirect URI is the same URI that was used when requesting the authorization code. And the state is a value that's included in the request that will also be returned in the token response. And this can be a string of any content that you want. A randomly generated unique value is typically used for preventing cross-site uh, request forgery attacks. Um, the value can also encode information about the user's state in the app before the authentication request occurred, such as the page view or the view that they were currently on. To obtain an authorization code, you're going to use the previously constructed URL that we have in the browser. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the browser, paste in that, that URL, and it's going to trigger the, authent the interactive login and consent uh, dialog. If this is the first time you're logging in to use this Azure AD application, you may have to go through the consent dialog. Now, once you've successfully logged in, Azure AD is gonna redirect you to the specified URL with the following values on the query string. 
the code is going to be the authorization code. And then you may have other things like the state, with, which if you provided that initial request, it's going to contain the exact same value that you can use to check for spoofing to see if someone else is triggering this authentication over to your application. Let's look at how we can obtain the access token now from the endpoint. So to request an access token, we can make that programmatically, not interactively. What we're gonna do is we're gonna issue an HTTP post to the Azure AD OAuth2 v2 token endpoint. And we're gonna include the following values in the body of that request that's gonna be form encoded. The client ID, again, is the Azure AD client ID, and the secret is the application's password. The scope is a space delimited list of scopes or permissions that we're requesting. The code value should equal the authorization code that we got back from the authentication process. The grant type tells the token endpoint the type of grant that we're using. And in this case, we're using the authorization code flow, but the other type is a refresh token because maybe I'm passing in a refresh token to get a new access token. And the redirect URI, that's the same URI that is gonna be used when requesting the authorization token. So in the second step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna exchange the, the code for an access token. So once you have an authorization code, you need to exchange it for an access token. The authoriza authorization code expires in just a few moments. So it's best to request an access token immediately after obtaining the authorization code. The screenshot here is from the utility Postman, which makes it really easy to create HTTP requests. This shows the result from the previous slide's request. So the token type, as you can see, is a bearer. The scopes are what permissions the access token has been granted for. The access token is a JWT token, otherwise known as a JWT token, which we can decode this to see the contents using a JWT decoder, such as the one you would find at JWT.io. And the ID token is also a JWT token, but it's being returned from issuing the scope open ID in the token request. And that's gonna give us some identity information about the current user. This screenshot is also from the utility Postman, which makes it easy to request HTTP requests. So what's involved in manually requesting uh, the Microsoft Graph REST API? To call the Microsoft Graph REST API, you must include the OAuth access token in the request headers. So I'm gonna add a header for the authorization and the value of this header is bearer space and then the authorization code. The screenshot here is from the utility Postman, which makes it really easy to create those HTTP requests. And this is the response that you're gonna end up getting back. One of the things that I can do with this is I can then use the OData query parameters to manipulate the results. So to control the query and the results returned by the Graph REST API, I'm gonna use OData query parameters. The select parameter is for filtering out properties, so only getting the properties back that I want. Top sets the page size of the results. Skip is gonna index into the result set and it's gonna be used to implement like paging in a combination with the top uh, parameter. Filter is gonna filter results. Count retrieves the total count of matching resources. Order by orders the results. Expand retrieves the related resources. And this screenshot again is also from Postman which I referred to before. Now in this demo, we're gonna use a combination of the browser and the HTTP utility called Postman to authenticate with Azure AD and request data from the Microsoft Graph REST API. And we're gonna do this completely manually, all with raw HTTP requests. This is gonna help you understand the process that's involved with authenticating with Azure AD and requesting stuff from the Graph. So the first step is gonna to be to authenticate with Azure AD to establish our identity. And once I do that, I can then request an access token from uh, Azure AD. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a URL that I'm going to um, customize that is going to give me, is gonna authenticate me with uh, Azure AD. I'm gonna send this to the authorization endpoint and that's gonna have me log in. So what I've done here, this is what the URL looks like. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in the browser in just a minute. So I'm gonna go to the authorization endpoint and notice I'm going to the V2 endpoint. And I need to tell it what application I'm logging in for. So I cr previously created a web application. So I'm gonna grab that ID and paste him in. 
and I'm gonna tell it that I'm looking for an authorization code in, my resp in the response that comes back. The redirect URI is a URL encoded uh, version of the redirect uh, site that I specified or a redirect URL that I specified when I created the web platform in my application in the app registration portal. Uh, and that was just localhost at port 1234. I'm gonna say the response mode that I want is a query. So it's gonna redirect me with the authorization code in the URL. And then I'm gonna use the scope here and say, these are the permissions I'm looking for. And again, this is a space delimited uh, string that has been URL encoded. So what you can see there is I'm looking for open ID. Here is, there's a space followed by graph.microsoft.com slash user read. And then here's another one for calendars read. And then I'm passing in a state of one, two, three, four, five. And you will see the state is gonna be returned back to me on, an accessible prompt, on a successful prompt. So let's take all of this. And what we need to do is we need to put this all on one line. And then we will grab this entire URL and I'll copy it. And now I'm gonna go through and launch uh, a browser. So let's open up Edge. So now that I've opened up Edge, let's go ahead and paste in this URL that we just created. This is gonna take me over to Azure AD and prompt me to sign in. So let's go ahead and I'll use my credentials to sign in. It is then going to identify the application that we had created previously. In this case, I've not consented this app in the past. So it's gonna ask me saying that it wants to do these things. Do I accept it? Now, what this is going to do when I click accept, this is gonna read, this is gonna authenticate me Re and redirect me back to the re re redirect URI that I specified in that URL, which was localhost port 12345. But that site does not exist. It's not running right now. So we're gonna get what looks like an error, but what we're really interested in is just the URL that it, that it used. So let's go ahead and let the authentication process work. And then I'm gonna grab this URL and let's copy this and go back over to VS Code and I'm gonna paste it in, and I'm gonna look for a few values here that we wanna break up. So I'm gonna go with the state value right there. Here's a session state, and there's the code. So it took us back to our site. We got our session state, our state back, which is the same value we used here. This session state is added by Azure AD, and then there's the code that we're looking for. So this guy, this is what we really are interested in right here. So we're gonna come back to this in just a minute. Now we have an authorization code. And the next step is gonna to be to take that code and exchange it for a access token. So I'm gonna switch over to Postman and we're gonna do this uh, in a nice, like, nice clean request here. Uh, we may fail the first time because the, that access token is only good for a certain amount of time or that, that authorization code is only good for a very short period of time. So we may have to go back through that authentication dance again uh, to um, get a new code because it may have expired. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna issue an HTTP post. So this can be done in a non-interactive way, which is why I'm not doing it in the browser. So I'm gonna go to login.microsoftonline.com slash common slash OAuth2 slash v2.0 tokens. This is the token endpoint here. Now in the body tab over here, I'm gonna go specify some data that I need to pass into it. So we're gonna have things like the client ID. We're gonna have the client secret. We're going to pass in the scope. We're gonna pass in a redirect URI. We're gonna get the grant type, and this is gonna be equal to an authorization code because this is the kind, this is the type of grant that we're looking for. And then we're also gonna pass in the actual code itself. So let's go grab the code because you know what that is. So that's this value right here. The redirect URI, we knew that that was HTTPS, localhost, 1234. The scopes that we were looking for, well that was open ID, right? Space, HTTPS, 
graph.microsoft.com slash user.read. And then we were going to do the exact same one again, but it was going to be calendars.read. The secret, well, we copied that earlier when we actually created our application. So I'm going to make sure that I grab that and paste him in. And then the client ID is our Azure AD um, client application that we had gotten instance to earlier um, as well. So let's go ahead and send that over and see if our code is still valid. And we, let's take a look at this and make sure that everything looks okay. We got an error back. We got some. We got a successful response back, but that's just a, we're getting an HTML response. That's not correct. Oh, here we go. We made a mistake. We need to make sure this is an HTTPS. So now we'll send it. And that's what we were expecting down there. So if I scroll down, we can see a whole bunch of stuff. We have our token type is a bearer token. It is This token is good for these scopes. Um, it tells us how many uh, seconds it's going to expire in. And then here's our token. So I can take this entire token right here, this entire value, copy that, and let's save that inside of our little workspace here. So we'll just call this our access token. But then we also have an ID token. So let's go grab that ID token. Copy that and paste it in over here as well. We want to take a look at both of these. So, so if I come over here and I look at my access token and let's copy that and let's see what's inside of it. And I come over here to this site called JWT.io and scroll down and paste in our access token. What we should see is I can see that who the person was that made the request, what the IP address was that they came from, and then there's their full name. And I can also see things like, what's the scope of this? This It was required, it was requesting permissions, and these are the permissions that this token is good for. Uh, it'll also tell us things like, um, what's the unique ID for this, uh, and a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, see what the subject is, so what the ID is for, a whole bunch of stuff with this token. Now, how are we going to use this? Well, let's come back over here, and let's open up a new tab, and let's make a request to the Microsoft Graph. So I'm going to make a request. So we're going to do an HTTPS call to graph.microsoft.com slash v1.0 slash me. And what I need to do now is in the headers here, I need to add in a new header for an authorization header. And the value is going to be bearer space and my access token. So that's the access token that we had copied and pasted before that was still on the clipboard. And and here we can see when we're running results or run a request, I'm getting back the information about the currently logged in user. So here I've got the, my ID, I've got my phone, which is not my real phone, um, and then name and email address as well. And there's other things that we can do with this too. I can start going and getting things like different events. So maybe I want to go in and pass in slash events and then hit send. And I can see a list of all of my events coming back. And we can even get a little bit more detailed here by adding some parameters to our request. So I'll put a dollar select on the top. And this is just a nice little GUI to, to craft the URL. And I'll say I just want the subject and the start date for each one. I'm also only interested in the top three, four events. And we're going to skip the first, say, five. I hit send. And now if I toggle the params off again and scroll down, we can see I have a much smaller result set of just start dates and the subject of the actual event. And so with this demo, you've seen how to manually issue the request to the REST API in Microsoft Graph. In this last section, we're gonna see how to use the Graph REST API in a ASP.NET MVC based web application. So we're going to first leverage Owen and MSAL middleware to handle the authentication and then use the native.NET HTTP APIs to issue an HTTP request to a REST API, in our case, the Microsoft Graph REST API. Now I would also going to, we're going to look at something called JSON.NET for dealing with the OData JSON responses. So let's create an ASP.NET web application that's configured with MSAL and Owen middleware for authentication with Azure AD.
So I'm first gonna create the application, but I'm not gonna use the Visual Studio Wizard to enable the authentication. And the reason for that is because we wanna use the Microsoft Authentication Library V2 endpoint. And technically that's still in, in preview. So we don't wanna use the wizard that's available to us in Visual Studio. Instead, we're gonna manually do that. The first step is to configure our application for only supporting SSL because it's, we're gonna be dealing with credentials and tokens, and that's the only thing that, that Azure AD is gonna to respond to is one that's been where everything is encrypted. Then I'm gonna configure it for the application for MSAL and Owen middleware, and that's gonna involve installing a few NuGet packages. The NuGet packages we're gonna get are all listed here on this slide. Now, at the time of recording the screencast, the Microsoft.identity.client package, which is the MSAL library, it's in pre-release. So we're gonna make sure that we need to include the pre-release packages either by using the checkbox in the Visual Studio uh, GUI for managing NuGet packages or including the pre-switch if I'm doing this to add, if I'm adding packages using the PowerShell interface with NuGet. Once the production bits are released, I should, all, I should go back to my application and make sure that I've updated it to use the production uh, library. So how do I call the Microsoft Graph REST API from ASP.NET? Well, I'm gonna use the .NET native APIs to call the Microsoft Graph REST API, and then I'm gonna modify the request to include the authorization header value. So here you can see in the code that I've created a uh, endpoint that I'm gonna end up requesting, and then I'm simply saying, uh, creating an HTTP client, and then creating a new GET request using that query, and adding in the uh, some header values. So saying I only want to get back in the accept header JSON data and the authorization header value should be bearer space and then the access token that I'm passing in as well. Now one thing you should take a look at is look at using something called JSON.NET to deserialize the OData response from the REST API. Um, what you can do is you can create a object representation of the data and then it makes it a lot easier to work with that data. So here on the right-hand side, you can see that I've created a graph OData event. And inside of that, we have things like graph OData date. And then if I come back over to the left side, there's my graph OData date class at the bottom, which is just looking at two properties called date time and time zone. The JSON property um, decorator that you see before all those different properties and all the different um, classes, that's simply giving json.net the actual name of the property inside of the raw response. But I can have these different strong type things like capital T for time zone. I can put that in there to, to make it easier for me to work with this uh, in the API and in my application. Then I'm gonna use the json.net to deserialize the OData response from the REST API using that graph OData response object that I just defined. So you see here, once I've issued the request, I'm then gonna read the whole response back as a string, and I'm gonna call json convert.deserialize object and pass in the type of the custom object that I've created, and then pass in the JSON string. And once I've done that, then I have strongly typed object that I can work with, like result.events. In this last demo, we're gonna see what's required to update an existing ASP.NET MVC application that already is logging in to Azure AD with the Microsoft Authentication Library uh, to see what we need to do to call the Microsoft Graph REST API. Uh, so we're going to be working with the REST API, so we're going to do a little bit of extra work here to make our lives a little bit easier. And so what I've done is if we take a look at the models folder, I've created this new class here called the, uh, a couple classes in this. One is for the OData response. Now, when you get data back from the Microsoft Graph REST API, uh, like many other OData-based or REST-based APIs, the data is going to come back as a JSON um, string. And parsing the JSON string, you can do it in a lot of different ways, um, but one of the easiest ways to do it, especially in a, to, so you can work with the data in a strongly typed fashion, is to use a utility called json.net to deserialize the, the JSON string um, into a strongly typed object. So what I've done here is I can see that the data that's gonna come back to me um, it'll have properties in the JSON like odata.context and the value property. Uh, 
the value property is really a bunch of events. So I'm going to call them events, but in the response that comes back, it's going to be a value. And this is really going to be a list of objects. So I'm creating a list of OData events. And if I scroll down and look at this, these are the different um, properties that we'll find on the event. The OData.E tag, the ID, the subject, the start, and the end dates. And notice here, I've given them real names here that I want to use in my code. And for some of them, like the start date, he's a special type. That OData date type, well, that's really a complex type that has two properties, the date time and the time zone. And you, you should remember that from when we looked at the results that came back when we were using Postman to see the results, the raw results that came back when we made our request. So I've gone ahead and I've added this to my project. And then I came over here and I created this graph service. So this is going to really simplify calling the graph for me. So what I'm doing here is I have an a asynchronous method that's called get calendar events. Um, now what that's going to do, I'm first going to create an array of these OData um, events that I had created earlier. So these are just using, reusing the exact same object that I had defined a moment ago. I've defined my entire endpoint that we looked, we saw on the slide. So I have my graph endpoint v1 slash me, and then I'm going to create an HTTP client. And in that, uh, with that client, I'm going to also create a request message. Now this request is going to be a get request, and it's going to use this query object, which is the string that I passed in, I created up above. Now I'm going to then create two headers. I'm going to say that I want JSON data to come back. And I want to do use the um, have a bearer token or set the authorization header to have bearer and then the value of the access token that we get back uh, from our MSAL library. And we'll see where we're actually fetching that and, and passing that in. I'm then going to issue the request to the Microsoft Graph. And I'm going to take the response and I'm going to read the response in as a string. And then I'm going to use from the newtonsoft.json.net library, which is a NuGet package, uh, is available as a NuGet package that I've added to the project, which if I come over here and look at the NuGet packages, and do uh, newtonsoft, you can see that we've added this um, to, our, uh, to our project. So if I come back over here to our graph service, if I go JSON convert and I call deserialize object and I want to deserialize this JSON string into this object, now I have a strongly typed object of type graph OData response. And then I can then take his events collection and convert that to a list, which if you recall, that's what this return type was going to be. So I'm going to pass back a list of OData events, which you can see right here. Now, the next thing I needed to do was I needed to go uh, create a controller to show this information. So I created a calendar controller and it says it's index method. First of all, you must be authenticated to be able to use this controller. So that's going to get blocked and force an authentication. But I'm also going to say on the index method, go create an instance of the graph service. And then I'm simply going to go get a reference to use my sample auth provider, go get an instance. And we saw that earlier in, in a previous um, uh, demo where our sample auth provider has a method called getting the access token. So I'm just going to say graph service, get the calendar events using this token. And that's going to stick that in the view bag and hand that over to my view. And then I defined a view to show all the events that's simply going to enumerate through all of the events in the view bag and write them out to this table. So that now if I run this, and it's probably using our non-SSL URL, so let's go fetch what that is real quick. Fetch our, our SSL endpoint, which is this. So we'll copy that, come over here to our site, which is trying to get us to log in. So we're just gonna change that because that URL is not gonna be good. We are currently logged in. And let's go ahead and sign out just for to make sure that everything is clean. So I'll say let's sign into Microsoft. If it's already got me logged in and I'm doing a cookie based authentication, it'll just bypass go straight through, which it didn't because we had signed out. So I'll click sign in. I already have my password. And now if I go over to my calendar, I can now see a list of events coming from my Microsoft Graph um, 
uh, the graph rest API returning events from my office 365 calendar. So in this demo, you saw how to call the Microsoft graph using the rest API, but then I showed you also how we could take advantage of using something like json.net to deserialize the raw response that comes back. Just note, that's not a graph specific thing too, that I could use that json.net to deserialize any OData stream that comes back. You just have to make one request, see the response that comes back and write that object, that strongly typed object that's gonna represent um, that, op that, that response for you. Well, that's everything that we wanted to cover in this module here. So in this module, we had we covered working with the Microsoft Graph REST API and handling authentication. You saw how to do all of that manually with a utility called Postman. And then you also saw how to leverage it inside of a ASP.NET MVC based application and use JSON.NET to deserialize the data that comes back. Now, some of the things in this uh, in the demos were pre done for us. So I was using um, the samples that were already done ahead of time for us uh, for uh, speed uh, to make sure that we had enough time to get through the entire screencast. But if you want to do this stuff on your own, this tr this screencast is part of a larger training module that you can dive into. So what you would end up doing is you can go into um, the hands-on lab associated with this training module and each exercise walks you through all the exact same things that you saw in this screencast. And in the case of the ASP.NET app, it actually walks you through creating step-by-step um, -step the actual ASP.NET application instead of just seeing one already running and poking through the code as I did in the demo. So with that, thank you very much for watching this and I hope you actually got something out of it and learned something.